We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I was given the title of nutrition and paleo diet, and like Jim, I have battled with what, how to handle this, and uh, you're going to just get what I did. <laughs> so I made a decision, and I've done it. So let's start with the reasons for focusing on diet. Um, this is where I start my class on the evolution of human diet. Why do we bother to study diet? And I've just given you a series of them. Um, Subsistence strategies result from various pressures, including interspecies competition for mates and, few, and, um, and food. In other words, so you can begin to learn something about behavior based on what the subsistence strategy is. Interspecies competition for food and space, predator avoidance, and all of those things that are never considered when we try to reconstruct the behavior of some fossil species. And I'm not going to attempt to do that today. <laughs> Um, although I do think about these things in my mind, but what I am going to try to do today is to raise a couple of questions that we might want to think about when we talk about nutrition and paleo diet. So although Jim says that this is something that we shouldn't just focus on, I am going to be talking about differential survival and fertility, diet and fitness, not so much because I think they're the only way to look at something, but because food is the incredible thing that you have to survive in order to reach sexual maturity. And after that, you have to have enough food, especially the female, to feed herself and whatever um, fetus she's bearing, or if it's a mammal, then nursing that child afterwards. So food is incredibly necessary both for individual survival and for survival of a species. Um, the other thing is that having been at UCSD and looking to see what kind of work Shirley Strum's been doing for 30 years, I can tell you it's absolutely incredible. So let me focus on a couple of things here. Food and reproduction, getting it right makes a difference. So differential fertility, what you have here is rainfall in the preceding months. So between 150 and 550. This is what's important for what I'm talking about. Age at the onset of sexual swelling. So that's the age at which the female can be, or male or female can begin to bear young. And what we're looking at is a difference of almost two years between a low rainfall period and a high rainfall period. It's not the water per se, it's a matter of the biomass that's produced because of the rainfall. Um, Adding on to this is a follow-up study that she did in which she's looking at an introduced opuntia. That's the in opuntia from outside our area where you get those beautiful fruits and you sell them at markets here. And these baboons of Shirley's have learned how to roll the fruit in the soil, take the spines off of it, and eat it. Now, this is the rainfall, but as rainfall increases, you increase the opuntia production. The thing actually produces um, bright fruits year round. It's low in acid, 65% is simple sugar. Well, you add weight 
You decrease birth spacing, which is exactly what happened with these animals, increase rain, increase output, increase um, or decrease the period of time at which you actually come to sexual maturity, and decrease birth spacing, and you've got a larger population than the guys next door who don't have any of these things. So it really does make a difference in terms of reproduction, just in terms of the data that my own colleague was producing. Now, differential survival. This is what we're hearing about all the time, and I think I've heard it from several people talking about paleo diet. This actually started with a graduate student at Harvard, and I just checked with Jim, and in fact, he was a graduate student at the time that Jim was there, and this is Mel Connor, who um, then went to Emory, and combined with his other colleague, um, Boyd Eaton, they put together a summary of what they found of er, er, people in the ethnographic record of what they ate, and this they called Paleolithic Nutrition. They called it that, and it was the title of the article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1985. But you go and reread that, which all my students had to do, you go back and look at that article, and they're really talking about things like sodium-potassium ratio. Um, they're looking at um, whether you could eating saturated fats or not, and what we've managed to do now, of course, is go on to the paleo diet, the paleo challenge, the seven-day paleo for beginners. So you've got all of these things. Now, the thing about the paleo diet by Lauren Cordain, who was one of S. Boyd Eaton's students, it's getting a little inbred here, um, Lauren Cordain pointed out that these are the things we were designed to eat, designed to eat, and that these were the things that we were really selected to eat. And so that's the, where it's gone with this paleo diet, almost beyond what, definitely beyond what Boyd and Eaton did originally. You've got love paleo, health and weight loss. I even saw diet for children, the paleo diet for children. So I didn't put that up here. Now, in terms of what we were designed to eat, I think there might be another way of looking at that is, and that is, what is around so when we're looking at a tropical band, what is available? So in a typical West African forest, on average, um, this is by um, Ladith and Shivers, who did some amazing work back in the 90s. I also have to have my students go back and look at <laughs> papers that are not necessarily online. So if you look at that, what you see is that the vast majority of available food is leaves. So you've got 12,000 kilograms of leaves compared to 23 kilograms of in invertebrates and 500 kilograms of fruits. But if you look at primates, and um, I'll go into a little bit of why in a little bit, but when you look at primates, what are the foods that primates go for? Fruit, because it's high in energy. Insects, because they're high in protein and leaves, because they're also high in protein. But if you look across all living primates, there are definite patterns, and that is a relationship between food and body size. So if you look at the insect eaters, they're all small, very small. This is something you hold in your hand. Uh, Microcebus is one of the tiniest primates, and it's almost fully insectivorous. The large animals can survive on leaves, so mountain gorilla is about the only one that survives total, excuse me, totally on leaves. But most of them combine them with fruit in order to get the energy because you can't get enough from these others. So you've got frugivore insectivore, which are sort of on the smallest side. You have frugivore folivores, which are on the larger side. Humans, we fall into the frugivore folivore, but not many of us are folivores. If you look at it another way, this was John Flegel's description. What he did is he showed insectivores and folivores. There's some fairly pure folivores. We won't talk about those. Those are colobene monkeys. Um, frugivores, total frugivores, but most of them are going to be mixed, fruit and insects or fruit and um, leaves. Where are humans? This is where we are. We're almost up by the gorilla which can eat just leaves, and we don't. 
So do you think I'm gonna give you an answer? <laughs> no, the question is why, why are we so different? So where we have to go is back into the fossil record, as Bill said, and I'm really, um, I'm not a paleontologist, but we definitely need more information from the fossil record. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. One is an archaic primate called Carpolestes. Um, the next one is Egyptopithecus, and it is at the base of the d division between monkeys and apes, so you've got the combination there. You've got Proconsul, which is at the base of the apes. It's going to be... Then you have Artipithecus, and depending on where you put that position, you, there is a very different interpretation, and mine will be different from Bill's because I put the time period in a different place than he did. So let's move on. Carpolestes, this is a mouse-sized primate, lived 58 million years ago, and it was an almost complete skeleton. I mean, it's incredible. been reconstructed and now reconstructed arboreal as someone else was pointing out. These are all arboreal. We are also arboreal primates. But the thing that's so incredible about this primate is its hand, because what that is doing is it has hands on both the forefeet and the hind feet, as was pointed out, and what that thing can do is grab and pull something toward it. So it doesn't have to jump in the trees, which was the other idea, they jumped after insects. It actually can pull toward it. It does not have complete three-dimensional vision, but it's enough of an overlap that when it pulls toward it, it knows exactly where that thing is in space. So that's a baseline primate, is to be able to pull something toward you and feed on it, which is usually the fruit, which is the energy. Let's jump to 30 million years ago. And believe me, I did select these on purpose because to me these are really critical um, divisions, what happens here. They are prior to the division between the apes and the old world monkeys. The, but the thing that's of most interest is that it does not look like an early monkey. It has a body like a monkey. It moves around in the trees. It's arboreal. It grabs. But it has a head like an ape. So this is not like anything alive today. This is something completely different. And if we're going to look at the evolution of diet, we have to think about these animals, not just the ones that are alive today. Today, this is what the area looks like. Back then, this is what it looked like. It was a forest. It had, um, they had crocodiles there, snakes, various things like that. Thank you. So here we go. We got Egyptopithecus in the trees as a fairly large primate. We move another millions of years to Proconsul, baseline ape. Again, it is a monkey-like body, and it's got an ape-like head. So the teeth look like apes, the head looks like an ape, the body is moving around just like a monkey without a tail. And what we know from the biochemistry of it, what we know from the microware of it, everything, it's tree we know it's tree living, and it's fleshy fruits and leaves. Now, depending on where you put that line, Artipithecus is at the base of chimpanzees and humans, or where Bill put it was up where humans and not with chimpanzees. That gives you the interpretation that the last common ancestor was a knuckle walker. Keep in mind that the two knuckle walkers in Africa do not do it the same way. So gorillas do not knuckle walk the same way chimpanzees do. And the way in which Tim White interpreted this is that the last common ancestor could just as easily have been a biped as a knuckle walker. If you think about it that way, that gives you a slightly different way of thinking about diets. So whether or not that's what turns out to be correct, we ought to at least think about that as an option. Pan was a knuckle walker, Artipithecus was a facultative upright walker. Highly accomplished climber, Pan, it was competent, Artipithecus. Enlarged incisors for eating fruit, yes, fruit eating. That's what all primates do. And the um, Artipithecus, woodland to forest, omnivore and fruit eater. If we just go through these, we get very fleshy fruits, not like oil seeds, in the early ones. And this comes from bone chemistry. It also comes from um, morphology. If you look at the very robust Australopithecine, what you find is that they're probably adding in things like these sedges, 
which no self-respecting primate eats like that. In fact, I'm ready to take them out of the primate order based on diet. <laughs> if you then look at these others, the Australopithecines, the later ones, you're looking at things with the some grass in it, but mostly, again, fleshy fruits and leaves. You move into the more recent ones, and what you're getting are berries, grasses, roots, nuts, a whole mixture of things. And if we look at the very early homo, what we're finding is a modern body size. We think they're eating meat. And what I want to leave you with here is why. We still don't know why. It's not because meat's that easily digested. Yes, it's good for us. There's not much fat on it in, the, in, in a desert. So going forward, before we can answer anything, I'll just go through these extremely quickly. More fossils. I would put it at the late Miocene, the mid to late Miocene. We definitely need to know that. Between 4.4 and now, we don't have that many fossils. We need to have more studies on gut microbiota and how it varies across primates. How, and this is one of the things that Alyssa will be talking a little bit later, but she and a colleague, Schnorr, actually did have been starting to look at this in the Hadza. Genetic, physiological, and morphological adaptations of primates to different at different subsistence strategies. And finally, I'll give a um, how, shout out for Richard Rangham. We need to know more about when controlled use of fire occurred and when cooking began to occur, because we are the only animal that cooks. Thank you. <laughs>